Okay, so last time around we looked at sort of the more hardware-ish components of an Emirates system. So this lecture and uh, some of the next one, we are basically going to look at embedded system from the software side, which is kind of really uh, stuff you'll be dealing with for the most part. So those of you who are new to this thing, one thing you'll realize is that uh, writing software for embedded systems differ in one very crucial way. You cannot write the program on the embedded device, usually. Raspberry Pi being an ex uh, beagle bone an exception because they have a full blown Linux stack on it, but embed, for example, you cannot. So usually what you do is you have to write uh, separately. Uh, your mobile phones are a great example. You don't write code on the device. You write it on your on a host computer and then uh, you transfer it to the device. So usually what happens, kind of you go through these phases, write code, possibly simulate, then program the device by downloading the code to it. You test it, you come back, okay? And that's kind of a cycle that happens. And the crucial thing out here is that these two steps are something which uh, are not present in ordinary uh, development and uh, this is oftentimes for people who are new this is kind of the first stumbling block because your standard compiler tool chain and all may not work you will have to deploy something special in case of embed writing code and compilation happens in the cloud although you could download the entire tool chain and uh, run it locally on the machine there is no simulation but if you're writing for Android or uh, iPhone then there are uh, simulators uh, uh, then you download the code to the device. Sometimes, depending upon the device, they may have additional hurdles there, like you may have to sign the code cryptographically so that, uh, so like on iPhone, you cannot just download the code, you have to be an Apple developer, and then your binary is signed with a cryptographic key that you provide, only then it can run the code, only then will it run the code. So there are uh, sort of uh, variants around this thing. Most common language is probably something of the flavor of C or Java or something like that. Um, uh, it used to be long ago that you'll often have to dive into assembly code and all, but that's kind of passe. Python has become very extremely common uh, nowadays. And the other one which I'm actually seeing quite a bit is JavaScript. So how many of you are familiar with this Node.js? Anyone? Okay. So Node.js is kind of this programming environment on top of JavaScript. JavaScript is a language normally meant for usage in the browser, but then people kind of also started creating variants of it to run on a host. And what Node.js does is it provides an event-oriented environment in it. So essentially, it lets you write event handlers. External events are requests from another machine, data from a sensor coming in, and then in Node.js, essentially, you provide handlers to handle those events. And it turns out embedded systems are essentially like that too, which is they receive events from the outside world and you have to kind of hand, handle those. So what I'm seeing is that several environments, many of the startups uh, are creating Node.js variants, which are catering to the embedded side of things. Uh, but otherwise kind of traditional stuff, if you look at Arduino, for example, Arduino actually is a kind of a bastardization of Java. So it looks very, very much like Java, but in a very sort of uh, constrained form. Embed is obviously uh, the CC++ family of things. Uh, once you are into Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone, since you have a full-blown Linux stack, you can pretty much run anything you want, Python, Ruby, uh, Node.js, things like that. And, uh, okay, so this simulation is something that uh, kind of takes place at two place levels. So one are systems, uh, one where you have access to an entire platform level simulator. So uh, iPhones or whatever, mobile devices tend to come with that. So usually there'll be some sort of program which really mimics a complete platform. Uh, in Android, you would see that. In iOS, you'll see that Ditto on the mobile side with screens and fake sensors and um, sort of access to network and things like that. And the idea is that once things run there, you pretty much have a complete, uh, a very high degree of confidence. What they do not do though is that, uh, that the intent out here is to get overall functionality right. They do not provide you information about how many instructions it took to execute and all because you're running it on your host computer, not on the actual device. Some of them do provide estimates of how much power it would take. So like some Android environments have the capability to say that uh, how much, what was the energy consumption and all. So there's some profiling, but 
uh, and some sense of memory usage and speed, but they are not what would, one would call as clock cycle accurate modeling of the hardware. That's not what happens. Sep uh, and in the same vein, I have seen a couple of open source efforts which have tried to create something similar for Arduino devices. So you can actually kind of have a simulated Arduino on your host and you're running stuff on it. There is a separate category of simulators where these are processor level simulators, where what they do is they do a very detailed modeling of the complete hardware with the processor being simulated at a cycle level accuracy. And, in, and there are platforms for this where you can even modify the processor, uh, you can add new instructions to it, you can add um, custom devices to it. So for example, um, uh, for uh, MSP430 is a microcontroller from TI, and there are several instruction slash cycle level accurate simulators available for it. Which uh, on which you can now do literally kind of clock cycle and bit level thing. Uh, if you are modeling a system, each bit going out over the radio is modeled when it's right timing and stuff like that. Similar things also exist for bigger processors. So for example, there is a simulation package which is very common called GEM5. It came out of, I think, University of Wisconsin. And what it does is it lets you do a cycle accurate uh, uh, simulation of a bunch of different kind of processors, ARM, Intel, and to the extent that you can literally boot Linux on top of that. Uh, and now if you are designing a chip where you have added a new device to the bus and all, you can model all of, all of that. Of course, the flip side is it's extremely slow uh, because it's doing a cycle by cycle kind of a simulation. Um, so uh, th th there's a spectrum of these things. Just to give you an example, the way, so what I've shown out there is, um, one of the very early snapshots of Android simulator. And the way it works is it actually uses a virtual machine environment called QMO. So just like some of you may have seen VMware and this kind of virtualization thing which let you run Windows on your host. What uh, Android did was they used QMO, which is an open source virtualization environment, as in it simulates a complete computer system. And then they packaged around it things which had to do with Android. So you could literally kind of run Android on your host machine, but it's not mimicking the processor. It's mimicking the APIs that Android provides and kind of lets you do the whole thing. So simulator or things of that ilk become a crucial part of it. Uh, the programming these embedded devices, uh, depending upon whether you are on the low end stuff or the high end stuff. So we saw last time around that there were processors which are kind of relatively resource constrained and processors which are uh, relatively rich. They, uh, they kind of differ in uh, the type of facilities that you have. In either case, in each one of them, what you'll find is that when the processor first starts, it goes to what is called as a bootloader. And this bootloader is what fetches your main program and then passes control to it. In case of embed, the magic about when you put a file into the drive which appears when you plug in your embed, all of that is being handled by the bootloader which kind of first fires up after power up in, uh, in case of embed. And then somehow it will communicate uh, with the outside world or with some memory location to get access to the program. So there are usually a couple of common ways. One which you see in embed that you put your user file into the flash and then you hit reset and what the bootloader does is uh, uh, so the embed bootloader's life cycle is the following upon power up it starts up and it sees that uh, uh, if it is not plugged in okay if it is uh, and uh, and if it's not plugged in it looks into the flash area and looks for a file uh, of the right type and if the file exists then it will transfer control to that and that file is what you have written um, that's the binary file corresponding to your program it fetches that file from that area of the the file system which is in the usb flash drive uh, part of embed and then moves it over to the executable area and starts running so that's kind of the sequence it goes through uh, it also waits for the reset button uh, that's at the hardware level um, similar bootloaders and all exist in other cases. So in case of Raspberry Pi, when you burn Linux, there is a specific partition in the drive called boot, 
where uh, control passes and it looks for a particular file there which corresponds to your Linux kernel. Control passes to the Linux kernel and then it starts booting up. So somewhere deep down kind of at the lowest level you are really dealing with this bootloader and these are uh, things that kind of you don't have to write, they come kind of with the platform. So for example, there was a thread on Piazza about how to reflash the uh, embed device that you guys have with kind of the bootloader that works with uh, the firmware that works with embed. So what they are referring to with the firmware there is really part of it, major part of it is really just updating the bootloader so that it speaks the embed interface and so that you can interact uh, on the host side. So, uh, okay. Uh, let's see. One other thing I just wanted to point out is that probably the. Oh, wait, I think. How does flashing firmware work? Okay, excellent point. So, uh, depends upon specifics of the board. Two very common approaches. One approach is that most, all, almost all modern chips have a few test pins. They are called JTAG pins. And in fact, I think I had a reference to that in one of my slides out here. Uh, JTAG. Okay. So, JTAG is basically. Uh, serial communication line with a clock and what happens is there are these special hardware dongles which are called JTAG programmers and uh, there would be some supporting software on the host side. When you need to download a firmware you are going to interact with them it will send it serially and this JTAG among its various capabilities is the capability that it can write to the built-in memory of the chip okay and it just sends the data serially. That's one very common approach. The problem with this thing though is you need to have a JTAG programmer. Um, but JTAG has other very interesting capabilities. For example, I can stop the clock in my hardware and then examine uh, through its debug capabilities each and every memory location, registers in the processor. So it gives me a very deep level of visibility into the processor state. I could even stop the processor, go and change the register, and then restart the processor from where it left off. So it's a complete testing interface, okay, which is used for testing chips and all, and also debugging. Friendlier approach is that they provide, instead of having exposing JTAG, or in addition to exposing JTAG, they might provide you some uh, other way of communicating with the processor, usually over a serial port or um, through uh, USB uh, flash drive mechanism. So let's say specifically at embed, what's happening in case of embed is that you plug it in, it appears uh, as a flash drive for you. So what's happening is a flash memory area on the board which on which there's a flash file system, which is what you kind of see. You write to that. What the bootloader is doing is bootloader looks for the firmware file. Uh, looks for the file there and once it not notices it, it copies it over to the right area. So this way the complexities are kind of hidden from you. So in this case kind of the chip is using some other mechanism to fetch the data in this case from an, another flash to kind of wherever it needs to be written. A lot friendlier obviously. Serial port based stuff is the other one where you kind of just um, hook it up through serial port or serial over USB and kind of write to it. So JTAG is uh, kind of usually not the one which is exposed in kind of friendlier devices as I would put it, but if you really want to do testing and all that JTAG is what kind of gets used. So that's what's kind of happening. Um, uh, there is kind of the initial, so there are two components to it that you kind of update. There is the initial bootloader which is the very first instruction which is executed after you start up and then there is a firmware which is kind of the built-in operating system if you may and I think in this upgrade that you have to do you really are updating both the components actually there are two components being updated. Probably the hardest part for embedded system really is debugging. Uh, when things go wrong they are um, you, you, don't, you don't have kind of the usual 
visibility into the platform. So when you deb debug on the normal host computer, you have access to uh, debugging capabilities, breakpoints, and things like that. On embedded system, it's a lot harder to do. And here again, I'm excluding Raspberry Pi slash BeagleBone because they are like any other Linux computer. But once you start looking at other embedded devices, without hardware assist, without things like JTAG, it is very hard to do that type of debugging. So most common thing, I mean, lack of anything else, try to make creative use of hardware I.O. that already exists. You have GPIO pins, you have LEDs, and you can dump cr uh, at critical point status information on these pins and then use instruments like oscilloscope and all to kind of monitor them or your IEs in case of LEDs. Uh, or use serial port or a very common thing is that reserve a area of memory where you dump relevant state of the program and then can monitor it uh, externally. In case of embed, your program on embed can send data to the PC. It can even write it to the file on the flash, which you can read from the PC side. So uh, there's no general dictate that one could give, but make full use of the I.O. capabilities that exist. One note of caution, printf, which is usually a big friend of ours in debugging, is horribly, horribly expensive. It takes hundreds of cycles. So if you are doing something time sensitive and using printf, uh, be very careful. You don't want your debugging code to disturb the rest of the uh, the rest of the uh, system that you're trying to observe. Of course, its complexity increases if you're looking at network type systems and all. So, kind of essentially, in many embedded systems now, we are kind of on this realm of things. You have a network of stuff. Imagine you have a sensor network, a bunch of devices scattered over. They are talking with via radio exchanges, messages, and things go wrong. How do you even begin to go around doing it? Uh, bug may manifest only when the devices are far enough away. Your oscilloscope leads cannot even go there. It's, it's, it's a messy debugging scenario, and one has to kind of carefully think about uh, this. Worst situations is there is a bug in a deployed device, and now you need to update the firmware. Uh, so over the air, firmware update is very important. So there has to be a way for the system to revert back to kind of a safe state, some very simple piece of code that it can always work with. And these bootloaders have become very smart. I mean, for example, there used to be a time that when we were installing new operating systems on our laptops and all, uh, you really had to do it with drive and all. But now, like firmware on the Apple laptops, for example, it actually can do Wi-Fi communication and also even if my machine is totally messed up, that bootloader is actually pretty sophisticated. It can fetch an OS image from Apple's App Store, uh, even though my machine has nothing on it, because that basic capability is built in. Of course, Raspberry Pi and all are not like that. Raspberry Pi actually, uh, I don't know, anyone got Raspberry Pi and try, uh, so has it running? You do? Mm -hmm. Coming, okay. You'll find that you have to burn, you have to download a disk image. You have to burn a flash uh, SD card or micro SD card and kind of go go through a bunch of rigmarole to kind of do it. Now imagine something is screwed up, and that that is you have deployed things are not working. You are not going to go around and kind of reflash this thing very easily. So over the air updates very reliably is kind of uh, is something that one often needs to design. And I recall some of the sy early systems and sensor networks we used to work in and all. What would happen is after a f there was always a golden image which was always there where if things would fail after under some condition the system would kind of revert back to that. So kind of a simple known to work thing. So testing debugging is one. What the other aspect which makes embedded software very hard is the fact that there are too many things going on and you don't, uh, and you have usually a single processor or a small number of processors. So there are two very, uh, 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 two kind of main kind of IO patterns that you would see in these devices. One is that there's some sensor which you are repeatedly reading. Okay, so microphone you're sampling periodically and there uh, you're problem is you have to just keep up with it and make sure that you are ready to read the stuff at the right time or it could be the reverse direction. I have some motor or something to which I have to write. 
But the other one which becomes more complicated is that you have lots of events coming at you. Bunch of different sensors, if you're on a network, you may have a user, and all of these things conceptually, you have, you're designing some piece of software and there are lots of events asynchronously coming at you. So in a way, your one program has to do many things with an illusion of uh, parallelism, okay, or concurrently handling these things. And writing these kind of programs is something normally we are not taught with, okay, I mean, our normal programming style is we are read the input, process it, show the output, go back. Uh, rarely in normal programming experience, uh, unless you are you know, in an OS class, you don't get to do the kind of programming where there are a whole bunch of things happening. So OS class is one place where you see it, and the other is if you are into chip design business, okay? If you're designing VLSI chips, again, you kind of are doing hardware where there are a bunch of external signals coming and you are designing some sort of a state machine to cope with it. So you have to write a system which would be able to cope with these asynchronous events that may happen at arbitrary time in an arbitrary order and uh, may come together, okay? And how to kind of organize a software to deal with this becomes uh, becomes a challenge. So uh, what I'm going to do now is to kind of switch over to how is that done. Now in order to do it, I'm skipping the remaining slides of this slide deck and switching to the next slide deck because um, we'll go, go over that in more detail out there. So how is software organized? That's, so testing, debugging, these kind of issues, you just deal with it, okay? at some level and main thing is make, understand your platform and understand your test instruments. So anytime you are doing your projects and all and you need test instrumentation to work with, come over to my lab. We have oscilloscopes um, and uh, uh, data acquisition systems, all, all, all sort of stuff. Or um, visit one of the other lab, instructional labs in E, like 44110. The, the, this kind of instrumentation is a plenty in the E department, and you know, some of the CS groups may also have it as well. Uh, <clears throat> oftentimes, problems which may be hard to visualize uh, just from a pure software I/O perspective become very easy if you dump some signal on a pin and monitor it on a scope. Um, in other cases. Uh, just storing state in some part of the memory which you can subsequently analyze. So this is low level hard analysis but there is really no other way around. In industry, you do have access to these JTAG based testers and all and which are pretty sophisticated but uh, we don't out here, okay. So uh, in industrial settings, there are these special instruments called in-circuit emulators. What they do is you remove the processor from your board and then you have this box which emulates that processor and out of it comes a bunch of cable and a pod and that plugs into your board. And now you have a processor into which you have full visibility. You can stop it at any time, you can analyze every register, things like that. But these things run many, many, many tens or hundreds of thousand dollars. So obviously we don't tend to have them in an academic setting. Uh, thing is you probably won't have access to them even in most companies, okay, uh, typical startup and all, they don't do it this way, uh, uh, but they do exist. So if you are in a very rich mission critical type setting, you will probably find them. Okay, so organizing embedded software. So and does the embed you have told us to buy have a JTAG in it? It does internally, uh, depending upon the board, they even expose it, but uh, the one which I told you to buy, I don't think Say that the embed software is like an operating system or a kernel process, like what is it like? What is really inside? Like, is the okay? So, the term operating system is a very tricky one to define. Okay, uh, what I would classify it as embed software is what would normally be called the kernel plus device driver part of an operating system. Okay, an operating system in computer science also includes things like file system and stuff like that. Now, of course, it does have a rudimentary file system. Uh, it doesn't have a very sophisticated scheduler. We'll see where embed fits in uh, as I kind of talk about it. Uh, so I don't know, is your background CS or E? Yeah. yeah, so CS. So don't think of it the way you think of Unix and Windows and I mean, this is so kind of a- It's a process which allows to run a program, a main file which is- it has, it has a scheduler and it has rudimentary device drivers. That's the way to think about it, okay? And it has a rudimentary file system. Uh, 
but that's where it kind of stops and that's where most embedded OSS kind of stop okay and of course when you go to things like Raspberry Pi then you have Linux as well yeah okay so let's talk about how these um, and I think I think some of the things you'll see will get answered so software based embedded <laughs> system a uh, bunch of stuff surrounding but the heart of it is a CPU or and as we saw last time our CPUs are getting very complicated also they could have multiple cores big little loosely coupled tightly coupled so all of them are kind of dumped into this box called CPU and then the main thing is how do we kind of deal with this thing uh, so as I mentioned just a short while ago uh, if you think in terms of workload really what's happening in these systems is there's some workload which is just insanely periodic okay these are sensor sampling actuator control periodic communication uh, a lot of communication protocols are periodic in nature so there's a part of the workload which is of that nature and oftentimes this could be very challenging because your rate could be very very high and you may not even have the horsepower to do it on a cpu you may need hardware assist to do it okay uh, for example uh, let's take a sensor uh, if i'm sampling a sensor at a pretty large rate uh, if one way to think would be okay every time the sample arrives something happens on my processor uh, as an I a piece of code fires up and does some action uh, problem is that uh, I'll get killed by the interrupt rate okay I mean once you start getting into thousands of interrupts per second your CPU will just get killed by that particularly these low-end CPUs so almost always there is some hardware assist for it so uh, let's take something simple like um, uh, a network interface. You're probably not going to do an interrupt every time you get a byte. You would like to reduce the rate of interrupt by handling packets. In case of sensors, what many processors provide is something called DMA. Uh, anyone knows what DMA is? Yeah, okay. So the main concept is IO puts stuff into a memory location and that transfer from IO device to memory is just handed, handled by the hardware. It's almost like I have a separate little processor whose job is to move the data. And then only when you have sufficient amount of the data do you actually interrupt your code. So balancing uh, or making sure you are not getting interrupted much too frequently and putting all the load on software becomes very important. So there are performance issues out here, but conceptually it is a simpler thing to do. The other one are asynchronous workloads, which is sensors which are event oriented. They may send an event un at unpredictable time. A character may arrive or an event may arrive at times I don't know. And worse, I may have many of these things to monitor. So conceptually, I'm in the position where I'm observing many things. I don't know which order they will come, when they will come, but I have to be prepared uh, to handle them. And moreover, once when a, one of them comes, uh, if I begin to handle it, I still have to make sure I'm monitoring the others, okay? So uh, it, it, it sort of purely in terms of the control flow, this tends to be a lot more complicated. So concurrent interaction with multiple things is what makes uh, embedded programming kind of harder than our traditional programming, which is read a file, process it, dump it, repeat the process. So how do we do it, okay? So there are a bunch of typical ways that have emerged depending upon complexity of the system. So at the simplest end is what I would call as single program type systems and we'll see how they are structured. One up in complexity are those which you would call as foreground background system. Essentially they, this does one thing, this does two things and then there are two um, headed and event driven programs which do multiple things or at least have the illusion of doing multiple couple of key concepts that um, I would also sort of go over uh, is event versus thread and concurrency versus parallelism. Uh, these are terms which kind of often kind of give the same connotation but they are different. So let's first think about how software is modularized. So probably the most common soft notion of a software module at a low level that we are aware of is a function call. So doing something and at some stage I want to execute something which was a reusable piece of code so that is made as a function I make a call to it and the characteristic is at the end of it it does a return main thing is that my control flow passed from this module to this module so at any given point in time I'm either executing an instruction here or an instruction here I have a single stack that is when I 
move to the function call, I pushed some state relevant to me returning back out here. Okay, so that's how we are taught function call and function call is just so common that you will see some hardware support for it. So like the notion of return back to an address which you had opt, uh, pushed into the stack is something that processors tend to support uh, directly. Uh, the pro problem obviously out here is that these are strictly sequential. There's no parallelism out here. It's not like this guy and this guy is running in parallel. Uh, control literally passed from here to there. That's one characteristic. The second characteristic is we always enter at the top. Okay, so we always start from the top. And then of course there might be multiple places where we can exit from, but we always start from the top. So it's not like I can suddenly stop this guy in the middle, pop back out here, and then go back out here and restart where I left off. You could fake these things with appropriate maintenance of state and stuff like that, but uh, this is not designed for that purpose. On the other hand, the other extreme are what you could commonly call processes or threads and all. And this is where what you have really is two or more independent control flow. They are literally uh, as far as your design is concerned, these are running in parallel. Whether they actually run in parallel depends upon how much hardware you have. It could be that each one of these is a separate processor, in which case they're truly running in parallel, or they could be mapped to the same processor, in which case uh, an OS will make sure to transfer control back and forth. But at conceptual level, now have two programs, two or more program functors, and they're all sort of proceeding at their own uh, pace based upon the logic of the program. And then these nominally independent things interact with each other by sending events, messages, um, primitives which let them synchronize, like one can wait for the other, or they may have access to shared data structure. So again, those of you in computer science, you would see this thing in operating system type classes uh, a lot. Um, uh, main thing to note out here is that since each one of these is progressing at its own pace, has its own state, you need multiple stacks. So each one of them will have a little stack associated with it. And that obviously creates a problem in the restart setting because my tiny little memory, I have to divvy it up into a stack for each one of these independent modules. And I have to make sure that it is sufficiently sized because if the stack overflows, that is I push more data into the stack, then horribly bad things happen. And one crucial thing that tinier em uh, embedded systems do not have is they do not have memory protection or virtual memory, okay? So again, going back to your uh, thing, one other thing which kind of traditional OSs provide, and again, you have it on Raspberry Pi and all, is that different processes are shielded from each other, okay? And that shielding takes place how? Anyone? Like, how how do we make sure in a normal, op uh, normal computer that what I do in one program doesn't trash the part of the memory where another program is running? Hmm? Each process has its own address space. Okay, now having own address space is a matter of programming convenience, right? I mean, all it is saying is, I don't want to worry about where in the memory I am. I will think I have a processor which always has address zero onwards or whatever. Hmm? Kind of a sandbox, but the term sandbox usually refers to kind of a higher level kind of thing, but yes. Uh, Virtual memory, so that's the term that I'm looking for. So virtual memory, what it does is at the hardware level, it enforces this notion. So basically I could allocate, uh, so virtual memory does two things. So virtual memory in part does what you are saying. It basically gives the illusion of uh, common address space. And the other thing it does also is that how my, uh, like let's say I have an address, I'm looking at address zero to 10 for one guy. I'm looking at the same address zero to stand for the other guy, but they're mapped to different parts of the physical memory. Virtual memory is supported by what is called as a memory management unit, which comes with higher end processors, and it takes care of that mapping, and then makes sure that one, pers one process cannot write to another process. OS can write everywhere, but user level processes cannot. So at the hardware level, that isolation is enforced. Now, that is true if I have a processor like if you look at the processor that Embed uses, it does not have an MMU. Most, uh, I mean, one one critical threshold which you can say, which 
which, which is about sophistication of your processor is whether it has MMU or not, whether it can protect one area of memory from some piece of code that you're running on. So the type of processors you find on embed type things do not have MMUs. Raspberry Pi and all do have MMUs, and that's a big difference. So what that means is, even if I were to have processes of things on my embed, and there's a package for doing it, they're all sharing a common address space. So one guy can write to another person's space, and so and so forth. And the other thing is, they do not have the illusion of uh, as if they have the entire address space to themselves. You, uh, so you have to go through the manual pain of allocating regions of memory to each one of them. Make sure that you do not overflow the stack. Uh, if you overflow the stack, hell will break loose and it's very hard to detect. So a uh, lot of issues like that. On this one, there is a single stack. Stack may still overflow, but you can, may not have uh, um, the chances that one stack will overflow into another that possibility isn't there. So usually in these kind of systems, what happens is stack comes from one direction of the memory and rest of the code comes from the other direction and hopefully there is a buffer region in the middle which is large enough to minimize it. In the middle is something which is much less used, is something called coroutines. It's a bit like subroutine and it's a bit like thread, so that's why they're in the middle. And kind of the idea out here is that imagine I had subroutines which which I could exit at any point in the middle uh, and then the next time I call that subroutine, they actually start from where I left off. Okay, so normally subroutines, again, the functions, they start at the top and they exit from one of the returns. Uh, what coroutines do is that uh, at some point, then they return, return back to where they were called from or and then next time a call is made to them, they will start where they left off. So conceptually what is happening is a, sub a coroutine remembers where the last return had happened and goes back exactly to that place. And uh, so what that, so, so one thing to keep in mind is unlike threads, I still have a single stack. I have a single place that I'm executing. I'm either executing an instruction here or here. It's not that I'm ever executing things simultaneously. If you give me two processors, it's not going to help me at all because I'm only executing a single instruction. Whereas here, if you give me two processors, I can benefit. I can execute an instruction of each side. So there is no possibility of running things in parallel, but I have some characteristics of a thread-like situation where I can stop at an arbitrary point and go back to that arbitrary point, which I cannot do in the subroutine. So I can have an illusion of threads but still a single stack can kind of process of some of the niceties out there. So many, uh, many a times you'll see embedded systems use this to fake or provide kind of a fake version of threads, basically fake version of processes. So these three very kind of distinct ways of modularizing software. So now in light of this, let's look at kind of these different approaches I've highlighted. So the simplest one, is a single program approach and many very low end systems can be done this way and in fact Arduino is like that, okay. Uh, Arduino is almost like that, okay. uh, uh, tries to give that illusion at least. Uh, so let's imagine I'm trying to write uh, uh, a process control, uh, a, a controller with the following task. There's a clock tick which comes every 20 millisecond and every time that clock tick comes I want to do something, some, some, some task needs to be done. There is some controller which needs to run every 40 milliseconds, and then there are some other tasks I need to do which are softer, as in um, some, as long as they happen, the delay is not absolutely critical, so like update the display, accept input from the operator, and log some information. So I could write this thing this way. I could basically have an infinite loop, and then I could wait for the clock, and every time the clock comes, I could have the clock module run, and then additionally, uh, I could check, uh, if, so if it is time for control, it basically means, let's say, even number clock ticks, I can also run the control module. And then if I have some time left over, I could also do other stuff out there. So I can put uh, package all of this in a single program. And in a sense, what's happening is I'm kind of polling for the clock event, which is kind of deciding everything else from that. In this case, one thing which stands to reason is that for me to run the clock module, in a timely fashion, it must be the case that the time taken by the clock module plus maximum of the time taken by one of these four possibilities 
is less than 20 millisecond. You could imagine kind of other variants of this thing, but the main point basically is that uh, I have to kind of make sure of this timing, some such timing constraint is met. Let's imagine for the sake of argument, let's say output module, management output module, this is a logger, takes a long time because maybe I have to access an external device where I have to slowly write the data and let's say it takes one second. Well, then what I'll have to do is I'll have to split it up into multiple chunks so that I still meet this 20 millisecond time constraint, okay, in this kind of structure. Uh, so I'll have to, uh, I could make it kind of like a coroutine, I guess, using a previous example, or I could somehow just manually split it into a sequence of subroutines and kind of call them one after another. Okay, but the main point is I have to start splitting tasks so that I keep meeting this time constraint. So single program stuff uh, could be done uh, uh, basically on bare metal. You don't need an operating system. All you are doing is you are basically writing a single function uh, and then kind of coping with this thing. Simpler Arduino programs are kind of written like this, okay. Now, not entirely true, Arduino does provide access to some additional complexity, um, uh, but sort of at a high level, when you write a program in Arduino, it, I don't know if any of you have ever done it, it basically has two functions, a function called setup, which is executed at the beginning, and a function called loop, whose body is just executed again and again. That's how kind of Arduino code is structured. And then everything else kind of within that you have to make sure of. So single program approach works everywhere, but obviously has limitations. Why do you need laser in 20 minutes? Because this guy needs to run every 20 milliseconds. Remember the constraint was if you go back, uh, a clock tick comes every 20 millisecond, when a clock module must run. So every time the clock tick is coming, I need to be ready to run the clock module. But if I miss it, I'm, I miss You are not allowed to miss it. Oh, okay. Yeah. You are not allowed. So it's a hard constraint. Good point. So you basically have to, uh, so, so, so this is one place where you actually also should do some analysis, which is you are going to characterize these functions for the worst case execution time, and then make sure that thing holds true. There are tools which help you do that, but it's not easy. The problem is time taken by a software function has a lot of variations in it. Depends on the data, depends on the state of cache, all these kind of complexities come in, uh, but there are compilation tools which can actually seek to give you the maximum delay through the code. Very much like when you, those of you are E, when you design a chip, you have to find the clock rate, you find the critical path through the gates, or even computer scientists in a digital logic class, you would have seen it, you have a network of gates, you identify the critical path, the path that will take the maximum delay. Same thing in software, given a piece of software, from in all possible entry points to all possible exit points, where is the maximum path going to be? Complications come from the fact that I may have loops in the middle and all, so it's not easy analysis, but these things do exist. Uh, so that's one approach. The other is you keep testing and then put in some fudge factor, uh, good people follow rules of thumb, whatever I have observed in my data, I will multiply it by two and think of that as the worst case delay. So that's how you kind of do it, okay? And then you guard against it also. Like for example, uh, you, uh, uh, so, so there's a concept which is used, uh, in, used quite often, is something called wash dock timer. And the idea is that many processors have this additional timer, which you say that interrupt me after some time. And then I will start doing one of these things where I suspect something may go wrong. And if that interrupt comes and I'm still doing that thing, that means I'm in trouble. So the way with watch dog timer I could handle this thing is I will set, after this point, wait for clock, I will set my watch dog timer for 20 millisecond or 20 millisecond minus a little bit of a delta. Then I'll do this, I'll start doing this thing, and if the watch dog timer fires, then I will uh, do some corrective action. Otherwise, out here, I will disable the watch dog timer because I did a safe exit. So watchdog timers is a hardware assist, software analysis is uh, whatever, analysis and the compile time is kind of the other approach that you would use. And the third one is pre, yeah. Uh, okay, so this is another example, again, kind of, there are many different ways these kind of single program stuff is written. In this case, what's happening is 
uh, again, I'm in some sort of an infinite loop and I have a sequence of function calls that I would make. And I would again make sure that in the worst case, I would, I'm still going through this loop rapidly enough so that no timing, timing constraint is violated. Uh, uh, actually, again, RDNO's code structure kind of looks like this. This is the setup part and this is the loop body part. Problem with the single program approach is that firstly, uh, yeah, really I'm kind of using function calls as my software module with all its attendant limitations, right? I mean, once I call a function, I have to wait for it to return. I cannot stop it barring these uh, kind of drastic actions. Uh, so therefore, I have to make sure that they return in a reasonable time, okay, which is why those timing constraints uh, were coming up. Other issues which come up is that the frequency at which the main loop runs can depend upon what is happening. So let's go back out here. In this particular case, I don't have anything out here which is waiting for any event. All I'm doing is I'm kind of running through a set of function calls and repeating that process. For different state of the system, different values of data input, these functions may take different amount of time. Like for example, maybe when I'm printing something, uh, the amount of text I'm printing may make a difference or when I'm doing an LCD update may differ. So the duration through one loop can change from iteration to iteration. The duration for one run through this thing can change from iteration to iteration. So my frequency can vary. I could do something like this, where I can say wait for clock, and I know that clock is a deterministic event, okay, coming at a fixed rate. And in which case I'm, again, I'm, I'm fine. But uh, otherwise, generally speaking, I don't have a hard control over that. So imagine now, uh, so in this case, I didn't have any <coughs> control over the rate. In this case, I had uh, clock module and then the control module, which is factor of two slower. Now imagine I give you a system where there are a bunch of sensors with their own rates and they are not even nicely related by a factor of two like this. How would you write something like this? You have many different rates to juggle. They may even have an irrational ratio between them. Like, um, uh, so it can, it can soon get very complicated. Let's say I tell you that I have two sensors and uh, for every, uh, whatever, their rates are related, I don't know, 97 is to 99. Well, uh, it's a pretty complicated looking schedule that you will have to figure out to make, make that work out. So, uh, moment you start having many things with different rates and all, this code becomes spaghetti. Uh, so, one reason it becomes spaghetti is I want to make sure it finishes a reasonable time. And the other reason it becomes spaghetti is that I may have very dramatically different rates to kind of deal with. And moreover, all of this is assuming that all these different things are independent if they interact. So for example, imagine now, again, pursue my example further, I have two sensors. They, every one second, 97 samples arrive on one. Every one second, 99 samples arrive on the other in a uniform fashion. And I want to collect one second worth of data and then combine them to make some decision. So now I have three tasks. One running once every one over 97 second, one running once every one over 99 second, and the third one running once every second. Trying to do it in this single structure is going to be just nightmarish. And that's where limitations of single program approach begin to show. So when things interact, things could be extremely complicated to deal with. So next up in complexity, and again, kind of uh, very commonly used approach and embed and actually also Arduino to some extent a little bit like that. And the idea is that these are so-called foreground background system. So the basic idea, basic idea behind these systems is we realize that all processors have interrupts. And what happens in an interrupt? When the interrupt comes, we run an interrupt handler. And as long as interrupts are not disabled, we immediately go to it and do it irrespective of whatever the processor was doing. So in many ways, processors already provide us an illusion of concurrency between two things, right? I mean, there's a main, uh, there's a background stuff which it's always doing, and then there is a foreground stuff which whenever the interrupt comes, the interrupt handler takes over. So that's a high priority thing, okay? So, and if I have multiple interrupts, kind of the same concept applies, but let's stick with a single interrupt. Whenever the interrupt comes, the handler takes over, the handler returns, and then we, continue wherever we left off. 
So the main background stuff is a little bit like coroutine, right? I mean, it was interrupted whenever, uh, and then we returned back to the same place. And the interrupt handler is like my high priority stuff, which kind of takes over whenever things are coming. So uh, these systems make use of that fact. What they do is they would basically have a foreground handler, which is your interrupt handler. So whenever interrupt comes, we do our control module. Okay, so that's our uh, in our in that running uh, example, that that's what we would do. Because uh, so we take our most time critical stuff and we basically bind it to a hardware uh, interrupt. And background, which is what the processor is doing rest of the time, I have a for loop. I basically say, okay, is it time for me to update the display? I kind of do that. Uh, so kind of my non-real time task. So clock module and control module. So interrupt handler will always do the clock module. And it will do the control module in every alternate handle. And uh, rest of the stuff is running in the background. And in this particular case, for me to meet the same 20 millisecond constraint, I would basically say clock module plus control module should be less than 20 milliseconds with some leftover time so that these guys also keep making progress. So I'm making use of hardware mechanisms, which are pretty universal, which do give me some level of concurrency to kind of cope, cope with this thing. This still doesn't solve many of the other problems we raise. I mean, in this case, clock module and control module were nicely related in terms of ratio of their rates. Um, so things appear simple, but um, you, you can still have sort of complexity. So uh, now, more generally, I may have multiple interrupts. So many processors provide you many sources of interrupts, and then they are often prioritized, or they may have equal priority depending upon the hardware, and then they may have different tools about what happens if an interrupt handler is running, a second interrupt comes. Um, hardware details, but conceptually, the idea is I can create a bunch of interrupt handlers to take care of stuff, and then I can have background things. And these interrupt handlers can even pass data to the background stuff by making use of queues. They can do uh, uh, read the sample and then push it into a queue for this guy to handle. So for example, let's say I want to read a sensor and process every 100 samples together. Then what can happen is every time the interrupt comes, it simply writes to a queue. And this guy monitors the queue length. And when the queue length reaches 100, it processes it. So you could imagine those kind of structures. Embed is a little bit like this. What embed really lets you do is, they're basically uh, uh, for various kind of I/O functions and all. Uh, they, uh, their drivers basically have created the appropriate management of interrupts, and they also let you write your own interrupt handlers. Uh, Arduino tries to hide that a little bit, but you can still write your own interrupt handlers and all in more sophisticated uses of Arduino. Um, so. This making use of this sort of hardware provided concurrence, uh, concurrency mechanism kind of simplifies things uh, relative to single program approach. So if we can do two things in concurrent fashion, wouldn't life be a lot simpler if I can give the illusion of doing many things concurrently? And that leads to kind of the third part, doing many things concurrently. So single program approach, one task, foreground background, two tasks. So generalization, multiple tasks. So I want to ha I have multiple tasks which may occasionally interact, but these tasks are logically independent. I would like to think of my system that way. And so I want to have the illusion that they are running in parallel. I don't want to make any assumption about how many processors I have, because if I had as many processors as the number of tasks, my life is simple. I map one to each processor and have them talk to each other, except that that would be insanely inefficient, because most of the time, these tasks are doing nothing. Uh, these tasks are simultaneously interacting with external elements, so sensors and stuff like that. Uh, so fundamentally, to make this thing happen, what we need to do is we have to somehow schedule these tasks. I have fewer hardware, maybe even just a single processor, and I have to kind of multiplex these things on that one piece of hardware. And additionally, I, these tasks may need to interact with each other, share data, or otherwise interact. So. There's a hardware way of doing things, which I just alluded to. I can create one processor per task. And this is essentially what you would call a hardwired design. Uh, so I could either take each one of these tasks and a program, one task, one programmable processor, 
or maybe I can create a custom processor for each task. But then, and I can let them talk to each other by sending interrupts to each other or sending, uh, exchanging data over some queues or something. Not very efficient because most of the time these tasks are just waiting for a sensor event. Uh, another approach, the hardware approaches, which also I alluded to earlier, I may have multiple interrupt handlers and one background task. So if I'm monitoring multiple sensors and if each one of them is generating an event, uh, what I can arrange is that those events correspond to interrupts. I can create an interrupt handler for them and then uh, I have a background task uh, uh, which, uh, which runs whenever no handler is running. In this case, what happens is at any given point in time, either my background task is running or one of the handlers is running depending upon which interrupt came and depending upon how they are prioritized and all. And then usually in these designs, what we do is we make sure our interrupt handlers are very quick and if any bulk work needs to be done, they put it into a queue and my background task will handle it in a more relaxed fashion. You will see this kind of concept used in traditional operating systems also. So in device drivers and such, they usually put an interrupt handler. The interrupt handler does the quick part and then puts stuff into what is often called as a software interrupt or a uh, slow interrupt or some other terms like that. And then some other part of the device driver will kick in at a later time and kind of handle this stuff. Um, problem with this still is that still constrained and inflexible. I am limited to the type of hardware handlers we have. I still cannot handle more complicated stuff, but this is very commonly used. And like I said, embed at this low level is exactly like this. There is no threads or other scheduling in embed. All it is is a bunch of handlers and a stuff running always in the background. Okay, that's what embed does. And by the way, that's exactly what uh, Arduino also does. It's a bunch of handlers, some provided by embed or Arduino system libraries, some that you can write, and then uh, rescue the, uh, the background task kind of you end up doing yourself. So then comes up, can we do this thing in software without kind of uh, relying on these hardware oriented mechanisms? So doing multiple things in software, uh, one approach uh, which is very commonly used and it really is kind of a variant of uh, single program approach is the so-called cyclic executive or often called a static table driven scheduling. And kind of the main idea is the following that I have an application where I have to do multiple things and I know the rates at which they need to be done. Those rates may be totally uh, different. So I have to do one sensor processing at some rate, another sensor processing at some rate and so on and so forth. And then what I do is I take all this spec and I come up with a cyclic schedule. What I mean by that is a schedule which I'm going to keep repeating again and again. And what is a schedule? A schedule basically gives me an ordering in which different functions need to be called. Okay, so um, we construct a table and then what we do is we walk down that table. We'll first process, we call the function in slot one of the table, then it returns slot two, then it returns slot three, and go through the table and then repeat this process. And the idea is that constructing this table is done by the compiler, by some sort of a compile time tool, which would do it. And a very common, uh, so, so one variant is this, that series of functions. Another approach is a slightly different one. We think of time divided into slices of equal length. So let me go out here. Uh, so I may, I may take my time direction and then I can divide it into these tiny little slots and I could organize these slots into a frame. And then the idea is that uh, my schedule corresponds to what I am doing in each one of these slots in the major frame. And then I repeat this thing again and again. So, for ex so now given a list of tasks to do, I can kind of figure out what slot they would run in, how many slots do I need uh, in, in one particular cycle, uh, in one particular major frame. Uh, what is happening in this case is I have a relatively inflexible thing. I, once I decide the schedule, recomputing it is a lot of work. I cannot shift things around easily. If there is a change in rate the, or workload that a task has, 
tough luck. Uh, but this works very well where I need very deterministic timing. So uh, we basically um, figure out uh, what is, uh, things you have to figure out is what, how many slots should cons cons consist of a major frame, what should I run in each slot, and then kind of algorithmically schedule these things out there. Uh, this is very commonly used for communication oriented systems and they're also very commonly used in kind of avionics and cars and these kind of things. The entire processor may just run in this particular way. So besides the inflexibility of changing rates and whatnot, what other issues do you see with this kind of approach? Or what other advantages do you see of this kind of approach? So let's talk about advantages. What, what are the advantages? What kind of software module would you use? How many stacks would I need? Single stack, right? Because I'm doing each slot is essentially a function call. It works, returns, then I call the next one, call the next one, and so on and so forth. So I don't really need a real operating system underneath. I don't have to worry about context switching or anything like that. I just am making a series of function calls, one after another. It's never the case. Um, it's never the case that. Uh, so I, so I have to make sure that whatever I'm doing in this thing will indeed finish in this time. I have to statically guarantee, make sure of that. Um, and once the slot is up, I can move to the next one. So. Uh, software overhead is a lot less. All Again, all I'm doing is a sequence of function calls um, in this way. I have moved the burden over to the compiler. The compiler has to figure out that all my deadlines are going to be met, uh, that the function indeed finishes in this time, all those complexities kind of go out there. Um, no, okay, so that's a good, uh, Function calls are a lot less overhead than when you move from one thread to another thread. And the, so, so the claim I'm making is that the overhead of calling and returning from a function is a lot less than overhead of switching from one thread to another thread. And the reason is the following, when you're switching from one thread to another thread, you don't know what point thread one was when you are deciding to move from that thread to the other one. So your reaction to that is what is called context switching. You save the entire state. In case of function call, you are doing it in a more organized fashion. When you enter a function, it only uh, saves those registers that it is actually using in the function call. And then when it returns, it only restores those. So you don't have to do kind of this blanket approach of saving the whole state and recovering the whole state. So it's a lot more efficient to do function calls than to do uh, threads. That's point number one. Point number two is, in case of threads, as I discussed, you need to maintain a separate stack per thread. Here you don't. So in terms of memory overhead, you also come out ahead. So these kind of static approaches work beautifully for hard, uh, for where hardware resources are very limited. Uh, in fact, you could even imagine that this table and all that I'm talking about could even be a little hardware scheduler. In many cases, that's what it is, that the processor or hardware basically gives you a table where you put pointers to functions. And all the hardware does is it just repeatedly kind of circulates through that. So very simple design. With what uh, particular function uh, takes time lesser than time slot? Wasted, wasted time. Okay, which is why finding the right time slot becomes important also, right? But but you don't want this thing to correspond to the smallest one either because then your bigger tasks would be fragmented across too many things. So okay, that's a disadvantage. If this is all software, then how does, you know, we keep track of time and at a particular time we switch to a different Well, so time is being kept track of by the schedule you constructed, okay? So for example, if, I have to sample a sensor every so much time, then my schedule will make sure that that, uh, that the reading task is being activated at the right place of time. And you will still need some hardware assist, like for example, data may have to sit for a time in a tiny buffer, but what you will make sure is that before the next sensor data comes in, you would have that, you would have scheduled the reading task for it, okay? So there would, some sort of a 
buffering needed, double buffering needed out there, but uh, that's going to be fine. I guess. So, uh, where? Offline, uh, because it is complicated. Okay, and worse yet, imagine I had, let's say I had two tasks which were such that uh, every uh, uh, maybe every second I had to do 50 of one and 100 of the other and I've constructed the schedule and then suddenly a third task comes which needs to be run 33 times every second or something like that and now my existing schedule is totally useless I have to reconstruct a new schedule entirely so you cannot do these things online easily so the typical model is you do it offline and you basically assume I'm not going to have a new type of task we'll stick with this there is a compromise between the two addresses it tries to work offline and you shift, shift on the and you could. you could you could yeah and actually another strategy which is done particularly in communication systems out here is I may set aside some slots to be free to take care of asynchronously arriving stuff or stuff which is getting added uh, later on so you can just have a bit more relaxed schedule and so that something new pops in you kind of take care of it so uh, again as I said this is the two domains you will find these things used quite a bit uh, communication systems networks and the other places uh, computing systems where predictable timing is paramount so you will see these things used in avionics quite a bit and in cars they go under the name of time triggered protocols or time tri TTP, time triggered protocols, very fashionable in Europe, uh, European cars and European airplanes, uh, less so in the US. Yeah, so, so communication systems you'll find it, but I had mentioned wireless heart as one of the short range radio protocols, same kind of concept, Zigbee, similar type of concepts, so you'll find this thing in communication protocols quite a bit, even A22.11, it didn't start out that way, but once multimedia over Wi-Fi became much more common, so there is actually a mode supporting exactly this, uh, somewhat of a kludgy way, but this is kind of the idea. On computing side, it is rarer, uh, but you will find it in, like I said, avionics and cars, okay. Uh, it's kind of, uh, it's lack of flexibility is kind of, why on the computing side it's not used a whole bunch. So pros and cons, advantage is simple to implement, very predictable, no context switches because it's all functions. Disadvantage is inflexible, tiny changes in application requirements or addition of a new application will require a totally new schedule to be generated. Uh, also if I have tasks which are coming rarely but are very long. Okay, so let's imagine I have constructed a major frame of one second and now I get a task which comes every hour, but whenever it comes, it needs a minute. So I have to split that task into tiny, tiny chunks uh, to be able to do it. Otherwise, I will have a non-schedulable issue. So this task splitting or in computer science is called stack ripping. Uh, these are all terms used to the idea that I may have a logical large computation, but I may need to slice it up. And you may think, what's the big deal? I can take some long running computation and slice it up, but it can be very hard. Imagine the slice boundary is lying inside a loop. I have some for loop going on and I have to stop in the middle. It can be insanely complicated to do it and I'll lead to very hard to maintain code. Okay, so uh, this kind of table uh, task splitting slash stack ripping is something which is not encouraged just from a maintainability perspective. It can also be fragile. So goes back to the point Anthony, or well, question Anthony asked, how do I know how much time one of these things take uh, and there was a waste time wastage part right I mean so firstly I may have wasted time at the end of each of those tiny slots that's one issue but the other thing is what if I or uh, my error was in the other direction the actual time was longer what do I do so well in that case pretty much the only thing you can do is stop that task kill it don't let it finish but that's pretty much it so under overload conditions this is this is not very uh, well behaved also and finally cannot easily handle asynchrony right I mean this is for periodic stuff so the way they handle asynchrony is what I was saying that I set aside some slots and whenever any asynchronous events arriving in a particular major frame are handled during that slot 
the problem with that approach is I'm wasting all of that stuff, right? I mean, I don't know when the asynchronous stuff is going to come, so I'm always kind of budgeting for them. Not very smart thing to do. So, the fundamental issue which sort of complicates things out here is, and it's something that we see in our systems a lot, is that we have to f deal with the fact that I have multiple asynchronous, unpredictable, possibly rare, and uh, possibly requiring a long time to process uh, kind of events. So rare ephemeral events which may take, take a long time to do. So coping with these things, um, it's kind of hard and we encounter them elsewhere also. You encounter them in interrupt handlers in any computer. You encounter them in GUIs. So anytime I press a mouse button or do a gesture or whatever, embedded systems, they are really a very prevalent and then finally web servers where I may have a server, I may have sort of requests coming in from multiple sources and they are coming again at sort of random times and, and some may take a long time, some may be quick to do it all. And from a computing perspective, there are two uh, fundamentally and dual solutions. There is actually a very nice paper which kind of shows that how these two are at back from 1978 or 79. It basically kind of really kind of establishes that these really are two complementary ways of looking at the same fundamental problem. There's threads and there is event-driven programming, okay? Threads came from the operating system world. The notion of process is really what sort of became thread. And what happened is it originally was a way for operating systems to manage multiple users or multiple distinct applications. But now it has evolved into a way for you to manage concurrency within a single application. Okay, this is what, so normally sort of they were called processes, sorry for a typo, when we use it within an application we call them threads, okay, but they're really kind of one and the same thing. Point being that I divvy things up into threads which are logically independent pieces of code with their own stack, their own program counter, uh, they have the illusion as if they're running on a processor by themselves, okay, and they could indeed run a process on a processor by themselves if I had that many processors. Every time I have a new request, I can spawn off a new thread. So like if I were to imagine, uh, imagine this way that what I do is I write one pro uh, single program and say, wait for the next event. The event comes, I create a thread, hand the event to it. This thread runs. When it's finished handling, it returns. And meanwhile, I go back to monitoring for further further events. So this common paradigm, we see it a lot in general purpose programming. You could do it for, um, uh, you could do it here as well. The other one is so-called event-driven programming. And this is found a lot in hardware, whenever you design finite state machines. And again, uh, you'll see quite, quite a bit in GUI uh, graphic user interfaces. Web servers use them quite a bit also. Embedded systems use quite a bit. Much source of controversy. Uh, just a couple of quotes from, uh, so John Oosterhout, very famous operating system guy, why threads are a bad idea. And then he's kind of, created a hornet's nest and after that there are papers about why events are a bad idea and why threads are a bad idea and then different contexts flowing these things and all. Fundamentally, they have complementary strengths and you could program each way and I would generally speaking say for very low end systems, you probably are better off with event driven stuff despite its foibles. For high end stuff, you probably, uh, you can consider threads because they can give you and easier to maintain systems. So let's talk about what, how you orchestrate these two type of systems. So in case of threads, I think of my system, different parts I have, processing different sensors, doing different uh, tasks as independent pieces of code, independent threads, independent processes. Uh, and then they interact via the operating system with some shared state. So I may have a kernel, which would manage these threads. If I have a single processor, or if I have fewer processors than the number of threads, then among other things, this kernel also has to make sure that which thread is mapped to what processor. If I have a single processor, then I have to decide which thread is currently running. And I have to do it so that all of them advance, they meet their timing constraints, they uh, are all happy, and uh, while I still give users the illusion that they are running uh, as if each one of them has its own processor. So uh, these are a general purpose solution. Um, as I said, they are used in many different domains. Uh, the key challenge out here boils down to is how do we schedule these things? So 
base case is one processor, many threads deciding which one is running. And the complexity comes from I need to maintain some other objective also, like meeting timing constraints, minimizing power, uh, minimizing memory, one of these things. There are uh, uh, very common in this thing is what is called as preemptive scheduling, and which is kind of the heart of threads. I do not, the kernel would want to wait for the thread to give up the CPU because that would mean that some other thread which has a more urgent thing to do will remain the same line. So usually when you have thread-based systems, uh, it's very common that the kernel would have the ability to stop a thread wherever it is and then save its state and restore the state of some other thread and start it, start it wherever it was. So scheduling is often preemptive. Preemptive basically means forced by the kernel as opposed to cooperative where the thread gives up the control. So in cooperative systems, usually threads will have some sort of a call, which is typically called E, okay, give up the CPU. I'm voluntarily giving up the CPU. And then the control goes back to the kernel, which decides which other thread to uh, run. We'll look at the basic structure on this thing later, but the kernel maintains a queue in which threads which are ready to run are there and uh, once uh, and once the CPU is available, they get it. So, for example, in a typical in an embedded context, what may happen is, let's say I have a bunch of sensors and I have written corresponding threads, and uh, these threads are waiting for an event. So, somewhere in my thread code, I would usually have a call like "wait for an event." Okay, so uh, let's say the sensor. Uh, let's take an example. Let's say I'm monitoring a serial, uh, monitoring a microphone, which is sending me data every, uh, let's say I'm sampling it at 10 kilohertz, so every uh, 0.1 millisecond a new sample is coming. And what I want to do is that every uh, some time window, I want to take the samples and process them. So the usual way you would structure this thing is, I'll have an interrupt handler corresponding to the sample rate. Every time the interrupt fires, uh, I collect the sample and I put it into a buffer. Once I have a window's worth of sample, then my interrupt handler will send some sort of a software event to my thread. Meanwhile, the thread would have said, wait for an event corresponding to the window of samples. The operating system, when it sees that the interrupt handler has issued that event, will take this thread and move it from a wait queue to a ready to run queue. Sometime later, based upon its scheduling policy, the OS will say, okay, now it is this, uh, this thread's time to run and it will give it the CPU. And it will do so in a fashion to make sure that timing constraints are met. We'll talk about it in, uh, possibly uh, early next week and how we can meet timing constraints while doing it. But kind of the basic idea is that threads could either be waiting for an event or the event has arrived and they're ready to run. And uh, the kernel would make sure that, the, that at any given time, if there is a thread ready to run uh, and it is its turn based upon an algorithm, then it gets to run on it. So meeting, so in embedded system context, meeting timing constraints are the hard part. In case of web servers and GUIs, uh, it is a softer constraint, like web servers care about how many events I can handle or how many, uh, how, how many incoming requests I can handle, whereas in case of uh, a GUI, it is about kind of generally a responsive system is what we are seeking for, whereas an embedded system, it could be if you don't handle it in so much time, the car will crash, uh, so it's a harder constraint. Uh, and these threads talk to each other, and which is why that's the other service kernel provides. So I guess going back to your question about is this an OS or not, in this case, we are really relying on two of the things that OSs provide. One is some way for things to interact, and the other is scheduling. Those are kind of two functions that they have. So this is thread. Event-based systems have a different structure. So in, in event-based systems, we actually have uh, single execution stream. So it's never the case that more than one thing is ready to run. That is, it's never the case that if I have more than one CPU, I can take advantage from it, okay? 
So no CPU concurrency uh, is there. So the way it happens is the following, okay, that these systems have some piece of code which is called the event loop. And what this guy is doing is it's just waiting for events. And whenever an event arrives, it puts it into a queue. And where it puts in the queue is a matter of policy. But the point is uh, incoming events are put into a queue. And then the other side, other thing that this guy is doing is that it takes the event at the front of the queue and calls the associated function. And when that function finishes, returns. This is truly a function. When that function returns, we go back to the event loop and again uh, take the next one from the front of the queue. So thing to bear in mind is, so these things are called event handlers. So I may have a handler for tensor one, handler for tensor two, and so on and so forth. Or send handler for a radio or whatever other task you have. At any given point in time, only one of these guys is running. And when I pass control to one of them, I have to wait for it to return. So it's not like a thread where the kernel can stop it in the middle and give control to everyone. This is an atomic operation. Once I decide that I'm going with this, I have to finish taking some of the queue. So in this model, typically what happens is that the source of events are twofold. One is hardware events, interrupts which are coming in, and the interrupt handlers will put them into the queue. The other source of events is that are event handlers themselves. One event handler may generate an event for some other handler to handle, or maybe for itself to handle it in case. So an event handler may have some sort of command called send event or something like that, which will result in an event being put into the queue of it. So two sources of events, my handlers themselves and external world, namely the interrupts. And uh, in this case, main thing to note is there is a single execution stream. I have a single program counter. It's either in this event handlers, uh, in, in, this, uh, in these event handlers or it's in the event loop. I'm ignoring for the moment the role interrupt handlers are playing. So this really is for wrong background system, right? In the background, I'm running this stuff. In the foreground is what my hardware interrupt handlers are running. So this is a stylized way of organizing a foreground background system. Okay, that's what it really is, but it's very commonly used, it's being used a lot nowadays in web servers actually for a variety of reasons. So uh, the way kind of these programs are written is the following. First, I need some way for waiting for events, events in which I'm interested in. So operating systems usually provide some mechanisms. So in Linux, for example, there's a call called poll. Any anyone familiar with it? Used it? Poll or select in Unix? No one. Okay. I would like you to go and read up about this. What these guys let you do is they let you wait on events happening in what these operating system call as file descriptors. File descriptors are IDs associated with devices. So on Linux, you can say I want to poll for read event or write event on a bunch of devices. So I can give it a vector of devices that I'm interested in and I can tell them whether I'm interested in whenever these devices are ready to uh, be read from, that is they have a data to give to me, or whenever these devices are ready to be written to. Okay, so these are the two kind of events. And what I do is I do a poll over them. And whenever, and, and then, uh, and then control and, and Basically, at that stage, I'm just waiting for poll to return. When the poll returns, it tells me what event has happened. And then I can call the corresponding handler and then go back to the poll. So in Unix or Linux, that's how you will write event handler type code. In case of uh, embed and all, you can just do it, uh, I mean, uh, you can do it manually or they may actually, in many cases, provide you a mechanism to attach handler. So there is an operating system called Contiki, which is used quite commonly in, again, in Europe and in IoT world. And what it does is, it basically lets you register handlers. So you can basically say, attach this function to this event. Okay, and you can make many such calls at the beginning of your program. And then after that, you can say, enter the event loop. And all the event loop does is, waits for the event. When the event arrives, it calls the corresponding handler. When the handler returns, it goes back. Okay, so that's what it means. Main point, no preemption of event handlers. So this is very crucial. Uh, as I mentioned, once you start, you have to return. 
uh, this this guy has to return. Uh, uh, nice thing is, therefore, it's a function call, very cheap to do. Bad thing is that if this guy goes awry or takes a long time, you have trouble. So again, if this guy takes a long time, I have to split it, and that complicates the event handler. So that's a knock against event handlers. Handlers, therefore, should generally be short-lived, and uh, you should deal with kind of long-running tasks somehow carefully otherwise. It's used in GUIs, it's used in embedded systems, it's used in web servers uh, quite a bit. Node.js, which I mentioned earlier in the lecture, is an example of an event-driven programming environment. It basically lets you attach handlers for doing these things. Now, making these uh, events, uh, writing these events do re does require a significant change in mindset. So let's go back to threads. The nice thing about threads is that each thread basically makes the programmer's intent very clear. So like for example, I would like to say read a value from a sensor. So I issue a read command. If the sensor is not ready, the read will wait. I don't have to do anything special about it. I just say read the sensor value. If it takes 10 seconds to do it, uh, read will return after 10 seconds. And meanwhile, the OS will arrange some other thread to run. And then I would say do an whatever, FFT over the sensor value or whatever I, I could say. So my logic looks very straightforward as to what I'm doing. When you are doing event-oriented programming, you have to deal with this mess. So when you say read the sensor, all it is telling the sensor, uh, the read call to the sensor will return immediately. And what it is doing is telling the sensor that when you actually have the data, send me an event. So the way you will program in an event-driven setting is, you would say, I have a read handler for the sensor, and then I would issue a read call to the sensor. The read call will return immediately. Uh, whether it has data or not, it just comes back immediately. All it is doing is, it is telling the sensor, when you have the data, send the event to me, okay? And I have separately put that. So task things which were logically connected are now happening at different time. I have to issue a request, then I have to decide what else to do, and then later on the handler uh, handler will get called, and then when the handler gets called, I have to take action on it. So it can be relatively unusual programming style for if you're coming from kind of standard programming world, where I cannot simply say like read sensor, process it, write the value. It doesn't work that way. It is create a read handler, create a write handler, and then issue a request to the sensor, then do something else. When the handler fires, it will do processing. So this just the more complicated mindset. So that's the knock against event handling. It's very, it can be non-intuitive to write, but it is usually your only option in low end embedded systems and uh, much, much more efficient in many settings, which is why it is uh, beneficial. So let's take an example. Let's have an embedded system with a bunch of sensors. Uh, sensor number I, what I have to do is receive samples, process a window of events, uh, which may take much more time than the shortest sample, and send results as a packet over a radio. If I'm doing it as a thread, what I can do is I can create a pair of threads per sensor. One thread would be a reader thread. What it will do is it will keep, uh, it will basically say, read a sensor value, read a sensor value, read a sensor value. If I have whatever, enough sensor values, then put it into a queue. And meanwhile, my other process thread is kind of a processing thread, which is basically saying, is there something in the queue for me? If so, get it out, process it, send it to the radio. So very intuitive way of programming it. In the event approach, I'll have to create events for sensors, event for radios. I may have to split the processing into tiny enough chunks and then use the radio in this non-blocking mode where I will have to request the radio. And when the request is, when the radio is done, it will send me an event and have to keep track of all of these events. So that's the bad part. But there are positives too, which is why this debate happens. So I've tried to summarize these things out here. Threads are nice in that the programs written the thread way are usually easier to understand. Uh, because each thread is giving me a logical flow of something, something separate. So the, in, uh, I mean, uh, the intent of the programmer is more explicit. 
uh, they provide true concurrency. If I have more processors, I can put a thread on each processor. So that's nice also. And they therefore make use of these multiple CPU cores and all. Event have the advantages. They are better performing in many cases, partly because they do not require high cost support from underneath. They are faster on single CPU because everything is a function call. So you're not doing this context switching, saving processor state and all. They are more portable because one of the things that make threads non-portable is that the context switch part, how you save the state of a thread and how do you restart in the thread is requires low level assembly level programming usually, okay? And so if you are, want to write code which will work across processors, events work great because you are just making use of function calls which every known processor out there supports. Uh, Timing dependencies are entirely under your control because you are not dependent upon an OS scheduling the thread. Okay, so that would be a benefit. Negative, so I have a longer list of negatives for each. Threads are great until the threads begin to talk to each other. That is, they share resources, send messages and all, and lots of bugs can happen in the process. If you have a shared data structure and you are not using it correctly, data corruption will happen and all hell will break loose. Often threads are not supported by an underlying software environment. Embed, for example, does not give you threads. Arduino does not give you threads. People have written threads on top of them, but these platforms didn't come that way. And particularly in resource constraint setting where memory may not be enough, the fact that each thread needs its own stack can be a big severe limitation. It's hard to get good performance. So one very common thing is you may create many threads, but if those threads are unable to run because they're waiting for someone else, then you are not really getting any speed up. I, you may create one processor per thread, but if you're uh, if you have not designed the system properly, you will not get any speed up. And then uh, already talked about this. Threads uh, has a problem that programmer intent is like you have to see what happens. You have to jump around a lot. When an event runs, this handler runs, then this handler runs, then it issues another event, then a different handler runs. It's a very non-linear flow of code, which can be very, very bad. Handler must be explicitly registered. So for example, what that means is once I register a handler, even if I'm not interested in that event, that handler will run. And I'll go into the thing next time uh, more uh, on this list. Uh, long running handlers can be a problem. Uh, main, putting states across events because these are function calls. So I have no obvious mechanism to take state from one handler and pass it to another one. And finally, no CPU concurrency. So threads have disadvantages, but for the type of systems we are most interested in, often in a better system, namely single CPU system with lots of events and resource constraint, these reasons dominate. And therefore you would see event oriented things being very, very popular. Threads tend to be a little bit complicated. By the time you hit things like Raspberry Pi, it's a tough call. Uh, oftentimes you may be better off there. So let's stop out here and uh, uh, pick this thread up again on Wednesday.